On this channel, we have been talking a lot recently about autoimmunity in ME-CFS and in long COVID, and in particular focusing on functional autoantibodies. These are little autoimmune substances that are capable of blocking core physiological processes in the body, thereby creating symptoms like the exercise intolerance and post-exertional malaise. We've also been talking about treatments that people uh, have done in relation to this or can do, and in particular immunoabsorption, a blood washing procedure that is mainly available in Germany and which is also very expensive. And we've also talked about the upcoming Berlin Cures 007, which is an infusion that will be capable of neutralizing these functional autoantibodies. But in this video, I want to ask the question whether it might be possible for these autoantibodies to go away naturally and whether the body can actually clear them itself and thereby improve the quality of life or better than that, of a patient with ME-CFS. But first, if you are new to this channel, my name is Patrick Usher and I am an ME-CFS patient. And this is a place where I aim to talk about simplified explanations into the research into ME-CFS and long COVID so that you can be more empowered into understanding these conditions better. It's also a place where I talk about my own experiments with various treatments in order to improve my condition. If that sounds of interest to you, please do like and subscribe. Now, just a quick recap. I do recommend if you're completely new to the topic of functional autoantibodies to go and watch my video in which I give an overview of what kind of symptoms these create and how they work. But basically, these are a kind of autoimmune phenomenon which are capable of going into the cell receptor and blocking their normal function. And in the case of illnesses like ME-CFS and long COVID, the long and the short of it is, is that this can lead to a reduced blood perfusion into the muscles or into the brain, thereby creating things like the exercise intolerance or the brain fog. It can also lead to reduced heart pumping capacity and problems generally with blood vessels constricting or dilating uh, inappropriately in different parts of the body. And all of these things are happening because the autoantibodies are blocking the normal uh, ways in which the body would signal for these actions to occur. And we know that in the case of ME-CFS, the presence of these autoantibodies correlates with symptom severity. So the more of them that you have, the more uh, ill you are and the more symptoms you have. And we know that patients who undergo a immunoabsorption, a blood washing procedure to take the autoantibodies out of the body, that these patients, not always, but in many cases, do improve quite noticeably and sometimes quite dramatically. And so we know that from a, a study uh, by Professor Carmen Scheibenbogen into immunoabsorption. We also know it from anecdotal evidence. I've done a video all about uh, people's experiences that I found on the internet who've done this treatment. And so we know that the removal of autoantibodies leads to symptom improvement. Similarly, from what we can glean so far about the upcoming Berlin Cures 007 treatment, which will be a drug, people can also improve uh, uh, when the autoantibodies are removed via that process. And so we have, for example, evidence of four long COVID patients who did the Berlin Cures treatment and they actually all recovered from long COVID. Uh, so this is a, a really promising avenue of treatment and uh, a, a really uh, helpful component to understand about ME-CFS, although I do stress that it is, of course, just one component among many aspects of the um, pathophysiological mechanisms that are going on in these kinds of illnesses. But that's not what today's video is about. When we hear of treatments like immunoabsorption or Berlin cures, or we, we um, you know, hear of autoantibodies in general, we might get the impression that these things are very fixed, that the body has just created them through an upregulated um, immune response, and you're kind of stuck with them. But I want to question whether this is the case. The first point that's really important to make is that I learned from an interview with Professor Carmen Scheibenbogen linked down below on Gez Medinger's channel, these functional autoantibodies under normal circumstances have a life cycle of four months. Now that means that over a four month period, it is theoretically feasible that whatever autoantibodies someone has at the moment, they will be, they could be cleared by the body they could be reduced 
they could be um, replaced at a lower level uh, or a higher level by the next round of autoantibodies that the body is producing. Therefore, on that basis, it seems theoretically feasible that these autoantibodies could go away on their own, thereby allowing for symptom improvement. Now, the second reason why I think this is quite likely that, that uh, something that can happen is that we know that some people recover from ME-CFS. They recover from POTS. They recover from long COVID. It may not be the norm, but it does happen. And we know this because of the evidence that is being compiled by the likes of Dan Neufer on his CFS Unraveled YouTube channel, where he interviews people who've recovered using all sorts of different approaches. We know about it from the likes of Raylan Agel and her YouTube channel, where she also interviews people who have recovered from these conditions. And so if it's possible for people to recover, um, then it's not, I think, a leap to suggest that some of those people must have had elevated autoantibodies. Um, they, they, they must have been suffering from this autoimmune response. And something that they did during their recovery journey must have led those autoantibodies to become reduced, or even if, um, you know, not just reduced, but also no longer to be harmful. Because as I've gone over in my last video, sometimes you can have the autoantibodies, but they can be harmless. And sometimes you can have the autoantibodies and they can be harmful, depending on whether or not they are binding to the cell receptor. You can watch that video for more about that. But basically my point is, these people have recovered because these autoantibodies are associated with these conditions, it must be the case that some of these people uh, did something that allowed their body to clear the autoantibodies that they had. And this leads us to the third idea I want to share, and I should emphasize that this video is much more theoretical in nature. Often I'm conveying the research, but now I'm just kind of thinking out loud, as it were. But on these channels, like Dan Neufer's and Raylan Eagles, most of the people who are recovering are doing some form of brain retraining. They are resetting the stress response, they are resetting the nervous system uh, uh, dysautonomia. And I've done a previous video on why I think it's important to uh, understand that these illnesses are not just nervous system dysfunctions, it's very complicated. I link that video up above right now. But I still personally believe that you can influence the nervous system dysfunction through brain retraining. I know it from my own experience and uh, I think it's feasible, it's theoretically feasible that doing that lot for long enough could lead to recovery and potentially resetting everything, perhaps in conjunction with other treatments, perhaps not, but I do think it's feasible. So what I wanted to think about, and you know, I don't know the exact mechanisms by which these functional autoantibodies come into being. I know it's partly due to upregulation of B cells and, and the nervous system pumping these autoantibodies out, but I can't help but notice that all of these autoantibodies that are involved in MECFS and long COVID, so-called autoantibodies against G-protein coupled receptors, all seem to have a link to the nervous system. Uh, so this is something that actually a point that was made in a paper we talked about a few videos ago by Grubb et al. Um, so let me just get that up. So this is something where Grubb was talking about the autoantibodies in POTS and he writes in the second sentence here, it is very interesting that both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system receptors are immune mediated targets. So this is something I've noticed as well. Um, the autoantibodies that are involved all seem to have a link to the flight or fight or rest or digest nervous system. For example, you know, there, the, 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 there's the beta adrenergic autoantibodies. That, that ties in with the adrenergic system, the creation of adrenaline, which is part of the sympathetic flight or fight response. So those are the guys like the alpha-1 autoantibodies, alpha-2, the beta-1 and the beta-2 autoantibodies. So all of these are um, going against cell receptors that are somehow involved in the sympathetic branch of the nervous system. Um, then we have parasympathetic nervous system receptor function also being affected. So very common in MECFS and POTS to have autoantibodies against muscarinic 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 receptors. And muscarinic is just a fancy medical term for the parasympathetic nervous system, for the rest and digest nervous system. So in this case, we've got autoantibodies against that. Now, this tells us something. Could it be that when someone is in the hypervigilant flight or fight state for long enough, that is what starts to increase the production of the functional autoantibodies and... Um, uh, as part of a sympathetic response, I'm just thinking out loud, as part of a sympathetic response, and those functional autoantibodies then uh, go out and, rather ironically, they then start to make things worse 
they start to further stress the system. So they are uh, increasing sympathetic functionality uh, in some ways. And they're also decreasing parasympathetic functionality when they block muscarinic receptors. And so in that way, once the autoantibodies get going and get ramped up, they're actually further contributing to the problem because they're further stressing the body at baseline. So I wonder a few things about this. Could it be that ultimately these functional autoantibodies are a product of the sympathetic state? And therefore, is it theoretically possible that if someone does brain retraining long enough, let's say for four months, which is the life cycle of the autoantibodies, could it be the case that these functional autoantibodies could go away if you if you work on um, detraumatizing the brain for long enough, and could that explain why some people recover? And I and, and there is a study actually that supports this hypothesis. So this was a study that was actually looking at the use of a vagus nerve stimulator. Now I'm sure you've probably heard of these things like the NeuroSim device, uh, a device which I've experimented with myself and I know that people often talk about it in the MECFS world but this is a device which you attach to your ear and it emits a, a kind of signal which activates the vagus nerve and that the theory is that this helps to uh, balance the nervous system and increase the rest and digest response and to reduce the flight or fight response. Now obviously this is one way of modulating the nervous system there's also brain retraining programs like Dynamic Neural Retraining System, ANS Rewire, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but this, nevertheless, is a study that gives us some clue because what it did was it got people to wear this device. They had POTS. They were POTS patients. Got them to wear this device um, for two months, an hour a day of stimulation, and it measured the autoantibodies, not all of them, but alpha-1 and beta-1 autoantibodies, before and after two months, including with a control group. So this gives us some indication of whether what I'm suggesting, that actually it could be possible for um, brain retraining to reduce the autoantibodies over time, gives us some indication of whether there's something to that idea. So this is the paper. This is just a kind of short version of the paper. It doesn't go into much detail. But non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation in postural tachycardia syndrome, a randomized clinical trial. Okay, so let's skip to the results. And I say it's not in huge detail. But what they found was that after two months, the tachycardia, the postural tachycardia, was significantly less in the active arm, <clears throat> so the people who actually got received the treatment, compared to the sham control arm at the two months mark. So what they found was the, the uh, heart rate increase in the active arm when standing was 18 plus or minus 10 beats per minute, while in the sham arm it was 32 plus or minus 14 beats per minute. It's a very noticeable improvement in the active arm. But this is the interesting part. The anti-autonomic autoantibodies, alpha-1 and beta-1 autoantibodies, were lower in the active arm compared to the sham arm at two months. And so uh, what they then suggest in the application part, a bit lower down, is mechanistically this effect, this effect of the reduced heart rate increase, appears to be related to the, re to the reduction of anti-autonomic autoantibodies, so direct correlation, they're suggesting. So we don't know, actually, because uh, I haven't been able to find it, and I, I did find a longer version of their work, but it, even then it didn't include the, the, the results of the autoantibodies. But nevertheless, they are stating that the autoantibodies were lower in the um, active group. And, you know, this, the heart rate drop in that group was quite noticeable, um, uh, and and more you know, much more impressive than what was going on in the sham group. So that indicates that there must have been a noticeable, or there must have been a significant drop in the autoantibodies because that would have a role on the heart function. This gives us some indication that perhaps calming the nervous system over time does influence the environment of the body to 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 stop producing so many autoantibodies. And once that happens then the symptoms that the autoantibodies have been creating would presumably reduce and the functionality of the patient would improve. It also leads to the question of whether other things could help with this. I remember seeing a video with Professor Ron Davis, a wonderful researcher uh, into MECFS, who's working not just for every patient with this illness, but also for his son, Whitney Defoe, who's bedbound. Um, but he said that he thinks the key to recovering from MECFS is probably never to crash. And we think about crashing as a very you know, inflammatory state on the body and really activates the nervous system a lot, as, as you will know. 
Um, and so if we can get into a situation where we never, ever crash, you know, doing that for two weeks is one thing. But what if you did it for two months or four months? Could you actually influence the environment of the body to reduce the autoantibodies by that means? Could diet help? You know, something like a carnivore diet where you actually end up uh, sealing the gut because you're no longer irritating it. And therefore that might have a, a role in immune system function. So I'm wondering if there are ways, uh, putting out a positive message here, that, that actually the functional autoantibodies could be reduced with patients and over time um, without having to do some kind of expensive treatment. Um, on the flip side, a few things. Just because it might be possible to reduce the autoantibodies over time doesn't mean that if you have the means that you mightn't wish to do a treatment to get rid of them uh, to kind of speed up the process, uh, whether that is immunoabsorption or Berlin Cures, which, fingers crossed, won't be as expensive as the €12,500 in total required for immunoabsorption. But, you know, if one had the resources and you wanted to try and get better more quickly, it would possibly make sense just to do the treatment and be done with the autoimmune component uh, in principle. The second thing is maybe um, someone could do everything right, brain retraining, pacing, diet, uh, you know, all of this stuff, and perhaps they still don't reduce the autoantibodies. And so I wonder, and again, I'm thinking out loud, I wonder if in some people they have such an advanced autoimmune situation, the burden is so significant that actually um, it kind of has developed into a self-sustaining cycle. So you have all the autoantibodies being created, they're blocking cell receptors everywhere, they're impacted function negatively, that is a very stressful state in and of itself, and because of that very stressful state in and of itself, never mind the nervous system, the secondary dysfunction has become such a burden that it sort of perpetuates itself because the, the stress of it just continues to stress the nervous system and goes into a cycle. And so even if someone is doing brain retraining, maybe they can't budge the autoimmunity side of it. I don't know. You know, who knows, really, about that. But it occurs to me that not, like, in the same way that I mentioned earlier, that we see people recovering using brain retraining, we also know of people who use brain retraining and they don't recover, they don't get much better. And in those cases, are those patients with a very high autoimmune burden and they just can't shift it because that part of their illness has ended up kind of becoming embedded and stuck and just keeps self-sustaining. I don't know. I'm just voicing these ideas that have gone through my head uh, over, over the last while. In any event, this is something that I want to experiment with myself. As I've mentioned previously, I did test positive for functional autoantibodies, video linked above, and uh, I seem to have a lot of symptoms that would depend upon the particular autoantibodies that I tested positive for. And so one of the things that I want to do is um, to go back into a, a period of consistent brain retraining, probably more using techniques I developed myself over the years um, rather than any particular program, but to do it consistently for months and see then, you know, re first of all, see how I'm doing, but you know, retest the autoantibodies and see, have they gone up? Have they gone down? Are they the same? So that's something that I plan on doing. I, I do go through phases of practicing brain retraining. I'll t do a video about that at some point. I may do a few months with it, and then a few months where I'm not, or a kind of where I'm doing it in a lighter way. At the moment, I'm doing it in a lighter way. But I do believe that in order to make real deal progress, you need to do it as a way of life for, for a specific period of time. Um, but at the moment, I'm just kind of staying quite measured and consistent in what I'm doing. But that's something that I would think of. And then I could be an N plus one in seeing whether the autoantibodies have gone up or down, whether I could actually improve my functionality a lot more than I have so far. Anyway, so those are my thoughts on whether it might be possible for these autoantibodies to go away on their own. Uh, it seems likely. On the other hand, perhaps there are reasons why, if it's very bad for someone, that actually is hard to shift the autoantibodies naturally. Whatever about all that, I think a treatment like Berlin Curis that can um, speed up the process is a great idea. So fingers and toes crossed that that, 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 that will be available in before too long. Um, and that's basically it. So do leave your thoughts down below. What do you think about this idea? Uh, if you want to learn more about me, you can head over to my website, patrickusher.com. I've written a couple of books, one on POTS, one on thirst in MECFS, POTS and long COVID. I also offer a consultation service if you want to discuss this kind of thing in more detail or brain retraining. I mentioned I've developed some of my own techniques which I teach privately to people via consultations. If you're interested in anything like that, please do drop me a line. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.